kada se 80. godina prošlog veka pojavio na britanskoj sceni, Hanif Kureishi uneo je svežinu i kolorit svog indijskog nasledđa u ostrovsku književnost. Životni impulsi, strasti, rascep identiteta, rasna diskriminacija, pravila koje postoje da bi se rušila, samo su neki od tema kojima su Kureishi kao i neki drugi veliki pisci iz postkolonijalnih zemalja razbudili englesku literaturu koja je u to vreme tonula u letargiju. Hanif Kureishi, romansijer, dramski pisac i scenarista, rođen je 1954. u Bromli u predgrađu Londona. Završio je studije filozofije i rano počeo da piše. U književnost je ušao preko filma i pozorišta. Njegov scenario za film Moja lepa perionica 1985. dobio je brojne međunarodne nagrade i otvorio put njegovom prvom kultnom romanu Buda iz predgrađa. Slede naslovi Crni album, Intimnost, Telo, Posljednja reč, Ništarija, kao i dramska dela i eseji. Hanif Kureishi je nedavno bio gost književnog festivala Krokodil u Beogradu. Razgovor za našu emisiju krenuo je pričom o intimnoj mapi njegovog života. Hanif Kureishi, it's a great pleasure to have you at Belgrade, so welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to begin the interview uh, with one of the key words in your prose and of your life, suburbs. You grew up in a suburb of London. What was the, the feeling living there? Well, my father came from India, Bombay, as it was called then, um, and we were an Indian family. Um, and he met my mother. Um, and we grew, grew up, me and my sister, in the, in the suburbs in the 1960s. It was both incredibly boring and dull and ordinary. Um, but now, looking back on it, it seems to me that it was also quite exciting. But at the time, how did you feel when you were a child? I was mostly bored. I was mostly bored and, 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 and I realised now I was waiting to grow up. I was waiting to grow up and live the life I wanted to live. In your latest book, uh, you write that you were the only person of colour in the school and also in the suburb. Yeah. So uh, what was that experience of mixed race background? Well, it was very disconcerting because you were an odd child. It, 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 and, and of course, there was a lot of racism, there was a lot of violence at that time. Uh, and the racism was very, very avert. It was like uh, everyday racism. I mean, uh, uh, you know, common abuse. So there was the official world, which was the official world of school, which was really dull, and the white world where young, lower middle class kids got married very young and they went into factories or they became plumbers or... We were lower middle class. But my father was an intellectual and my father... It's your father, he wanted to be a writer. My father had been a journalist. He was an intellectual, he had a very good library. I come from an upper class Indian family. Uh, mostly of, of doctors, writers, journalists, intellectuals. Um, so I had a very strange childhood in this very alienated proletarian world with this kind of intellectual background and a house full of books. I read all the time because there's nothing else to do. Um, you know, you had one TV with two channels, uh, which your parents used, and so, uh, unlike my... I've got three sons now, you know, they have hundreds of hours of entertainment uh, through their phones. Uh, I had to read uh, Flaubert or Zola or Dostoevsky. So even though I'm a delinquent child and uneducated, in another way I'm quite educated because I just found stuff in, in the house. Um, and I, wanted to, I decided I would become a writer. How did you decide to become a writer? in order to escape from the suburbs? Um, I wanted to be a writer because my father was a writer and he was writing novels. He was writing novels that were not published. So, although it was odd for a mixed race, lower middle class boy to want to become a writer, it wasn't odd in our family. Um, and then I began to think about race. And I began to think about what race meant. And I remember somebody saying to me, you should write about race, you should write about yourself, you should write about your family, you should write about your position. 
And suddenly I saw that being uh, a, a mixed race kid in a white world, it wasn't so weird. In fact, it was a subject. <laughs> Ime mi je Karim Amir. Po rođenju i vaspitanju sam Englez. Za malo. Mnogi misle da sam neka posebna vrsta Engleza. Nova vrsta. Nastala u krštanjem dve drevne istorije. Ali meni to ne smeta. Englez jesam, mada se time ne ponosim. Iz predgrađana jugu Londona. I pred sobom imam budućnost. Možda je ta neobična mešavina kontinenta i krvi, stvari odavde i odande, ono što me čini tako nemirnim, ono zbog čega mi svaka stvar brzo dosadi. Ili možda to što sam odrastao u predgrađu. Your first novel, The Buddha of Suburbia, is part Bildungsroman and part a state of nation novel. Mm -hmm. You approach also uh, the topic of racism, mm -hmm. which was very strong at that time. You felt it, you lived it, and how did you overcome it? Well, you begin to try and understand what's happening to you by writing stories about it. Um, and you see that your experience is not unique, that there are many other children in the UK because Britain is cha was changing at that time. There were huge numbers of immigrants coming from India, from coming from Pakistan, coming from Bangladesh, uh, and then from, uh, 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 with, after Idi Amin, from Africa. So there was this, these huge social changes happening in the, in the UK. There were also, you know, big right-wing or neo-fascist movements. Um, but at the same time, I was interested in white pop music. I love the Beatles, I love the Stones. You know, I was a hippie, I wore flares, I took LSD. I was a brown hippie, you know. So when I began to write, when I wrote my first plays, I was beginning to try and figure out how to put this material into, into, in, into a form. In the Buddha of Suburbia, your main character, Karim, he has a Pakistani father and an English mother. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he has a kind of torn identity. He changes his class background. But about the end of the story, he doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know where his home is anymore. Mm -hmm. So it was the phenomena at the time you wrote it. It's also a nowadays phenomena. Well, when you're young, you experiment. You know, you leave home by having sex. You leave home by meeting boys or girls that you fall in love with. Uh, and your world opens up. Um, he leaves home, he goes to work in the theatre, he gets involved in pop music, uh, he moves to London, he falls in love with a boy, Charlie Hero, he falls in love with various women, and you just see a kid um, experimenting with the world. And you must remember, the 60s were a very experimental time. You know, experimental in terms of new families, experimental in terms of sexuality, in terms of music, in terms of political ideas, in terms of psychoanalysis, et cetera, et cetera. So he's part of that wave of experimentation. All the time, uh, he's searching for identity. Well, and, you, you, uh, can, you can put it like that. I wouldn't really put it like that. It's not as though you ever find an identity. I mean, in a way, the only the most interesting thing about identity is when you forget about it. I never think about my identity. I don't give a damn about my identity. I never think about it. I don't care. It doesn't mean anything to me. No? No. But don't you think that your heroes have the, uh, that fluid identity? Yeah, when I think of David Bowie, I think of somebody who... A, 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 a man I knew who grew up very close to me and, and went to the same school as I did, even though, of course, he was 10 years older than me. I think of Bowie as, some, as somebody who embodies that sense of experiment, experimentalization, I guess you would call it. Yeah. I don't worry about my identity. I never think about it. It's not a thing to me at all. I'm a writer. I think when I thought I'll be a Perhaps writer. Perhaps you, uh, you don't think about your identity because you're a writer. Yeah. If if you weren't, yeah, I think 
That well, you think about your identity when you struggle. If you're young and you wonder if you're gay or you're non-binary or, or whether you're a lesbian or whatever, you would worry about who exactly you are and you want to find the right words to express it. Uh, when you move beyond that, you, it's not even a thing. Kud god išao, bio sam jedina osoba tamne koze. Kako su me zbog toga ljudi videli? Počeo sam da se plašim odlazaka na određene mjesta. Nisam znao šta tamo meni misle. Bio sam ubeđen da mi se podsmevaju, da me se gade. I da me mrze. Ako su bili ljubazni, bio sam ubeđen da su prosto licemerni. Postao sam paranoičan. Nisam smeo da izlazim. Znao sam da sam zbunjen i... In your second novel, The Black Album, there is search of identity. Yeah, that's a story about a boy who comes to London and he's different to Kareem. He's more earnest than Kareem, the, the, the hero of the Buddha of Suburbia. And he gets caught between the rave culture, really, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the 80s. Let's say that he has two mentors. The first one who teaches him uh, Islamic tradition and faith and the other one, nice young woman, who is his teacher. Yeah. And she teaches him more than philosophy. She teaches him sex and drugs, all kind of experiments. Yeah. Pop culture, music. Yeah, there you are. So he has a kind of double identity. Yeah. Very fluid. Yeah. He wants to join something. He wants to find something. And I was writing at that time about a lot of young men I knew. I'm talking about the 90s who got involved in what became known as Muslim fundamentalism. And I researched that book and I knew a lot of those kids and I interviewed them and spent some time with them and went to the mosques and so on. And I could see the draw of, of, of so-called Islamic fundamentalism at that time. It was an ideology of the third world. It was an ideology of, of the third world in places where, say, Marxism or socialism didn't mean anything. And it wasn't Western, and it was based on an old ideology, which is the, the Quran and so on. And it made them feel very big and brave, as and you can see it even today with the Taliban. It's the same ideology, exactly the yes. same. At yeah. what moment did you become aware of that Islamic radicalism? In the 80s, the early 80s, when I went to Pakistan for the first time, when I found that all my family were, uh, were supporters of Ronald Reagan. And that really shocked me because they'd been leftists. But they saw that the, the, there were two forces in the world, one neoliberal capitalism of Reagan that had been developed in Chicago, uh, which we now live in, in the West, and uh, what we call uh, fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, which was very, very dangerous in Pakistan then and growing then. And then, of course, Zia uh, hanged her Bhutto, uh, and the country became an Islamic uh, republic. Mi smo prevazišli čulno je doživlje i krenuli ka duhovnoj i kontrolisanoj koncepciji života. Odnosimo se prema drugima s poštovanjem i ne razmišljamo kako ih možemo iskoristiti. Činimo drugima. A to je baš ovo što radimo sada. Da? Ako se budemo toga držali, reče Čad, moći ćemo da se odupremo, ma koliko budu nastojali da nas potkupe. A shvatam... To mi je veoma drago, brate, jer vidim slabosti u tebi. Stvarno? To je ozbiljan zadatak, ali Allah je uz nas. U novel je jedna grupa muslima studenta koji je učinjena da su oni učinjeni u posjeću učinjenju. I to je nešto veoma učinjeno, što se učinjeno u učinjenju. Who are those people who believe that they are in possession of truth? Well, they're the lucky ones, in a way. <laughs> they're the lucky ones and the unlucky... And, and, and very unlucky for us, you might say. Um, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to, to, to have the answers to everything. And they were free of liberal doubt. And they hated the West. And they hated the West with, with, with good reason, because the, the West had treated them 
for hundreds of years with contempt through the empire, through colonialism and so on, and still saw them as, 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 uh, as uh, uh, being, you know, backward, stupid, and, 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 and the West was very racist towards the, the rest of the third world. So suddenly they found this ideology, which gave them huge power and gave them, uh, 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 be they became very, very arrogant and very certain of themselves and very anti-Western. And they're partly, of course, a Western creation, as you know. The Taliban was created by the United States, supported by the United States after the Soviet invasion, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very complicated situation. But I just saw these kids, and they were kids like me, you know? Most of them had been born and brought up in the UK, not all of them. Some of them had come to the UK when they were young. But they were, they, they were very, very politicized and very determined. And they just look crazy to me. I mean, the stuff they believed. But now it's the ideology of ISIS. It's the ideology of Al Qaeda and the ideology of the Taliban. So there you go. Yes, on one hand, we had the intolerance of the Muslim part. But what about Europe? Is, uh, is tolerance that supreme value in our societies? I mean, in Western societies. Well, the West is becoming uh, increasingly fundamentalist, too. I mean, Christianity is a fundamentalism as well, and you see exactly the same thing in Hungary, you see it in Poland. Uh, and they're mirror images of the Taliban, really, the, sa the same ideologies, same hatred of women, same hatred of gay and queer people, uh, the same desire to persecute uh, those who don't follow the same ideology. So there, there, there is a very <laughs> strong consonance, you might say, between between uh, Islamic fundamentalism and uh, nationalism. In your prose, mm -hmm. you approach a very large spectrum of topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have already talked about racism, faith, intolerance, multiculturalism, but uh, you like to approach also the very intimate parts mm -hmm. of the human soul. Mm -hmm. Do you think that writers could be a better psychologist than psychologist. Well, Freud said that. He said uh, uh, all the insights he said that I have had uh, uh, about the human soul, the psyche, the unconscious, etc., etc. He said these insights have already been had by Shakespeare, by Goethe, by Nietzsche, by uh, the other philosophers, and so on. Except that Freud uh, 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 um, explicitly formulated them in scientific terms. What does interest you the most in the human soul? What questions? I mean, intimate ones. I want to write about uh, what you might call intimate things, about what goes on between human beings, between a man and a woman, or a father and a son, a mother and a daughter, whatever it might be. Pokušavam da ubedim sebe da napustiti nekoga. Nije nešto najgore što toj osobi možeš da učiniš. Može biti neveselo, ali ne mora da bude baš tragedija. Ako nikada ništa ili nikoga ne ostaviš, neće biti prostora ni za šta novo. Možda bi u svakom danu trebalo da se desi neko pravo neverstvo ili neophodna izdaja. Bio bi to čin optimizma. Nade, čin koji jemči veru u budućnost, potvrda da stvari ne samo što mogu da budu drugačije, nego i bolje. A very nice title, The Intimacy, is the novel where you write about the man. He's about to leave his, his wife mm -hmm. and his two sons mm -hmm. for the other woman. Mm -hmm. In a way, do you suggest that marriage and love don't go along together? Marriage is a really stupid idea. Why? I think everybody realizes Why? that now. It's a really idiotic, idiotic idea. Uh, this ideal that a man and a woman should be together and should stay together for a very long time, whether they like it or not, is completely idiotic. And now I think we've grown out of the idea. When I was a kid, you got married when you were quite young. You know, you were probably around the age of, I don't know, 25, 23, you'd have kids. And the idea would be that you would stay with the same person 
for, for the rest of your life, which is a completely stupid idea. Whoever had that idea, why would you have to? You stay with people as long as you like them and as yeah, long as they what, like you. What about the concept of, of family? So you write, in fact, about unhappy families or dysfunctional families. No, I don't. All families are dysfunctional families. All families find solutions to the, uh, uh, to the problems of living in their own way, you might say. There is no functional family. This, that's a, that's a, the idea of the functional family is a sort of fascist myth. It, it's an ideal that nobody can live according to. I mean, fidelity is a stupid idea. It's impossible and morally incomprehensible. But if you want to be faithful to somebody, then you should be. You can be. And they might want to be faithful to you. That's, that's fine, as long as it's mutual and it's consenting. But the idea of these relationships going on for years and years and years just because of the rule that they should is completely idiotic. But did you grow up in a happy family? Yeah, reasonably happy family. It wasn't happy for me, but they were happy. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I mean, they, they, they wanted to be together, they liked being together, but I didn't want to be there, particularly. I was bored by it. I needed more interesting people, I needed more world and other people. But they liked each other. You like to write about people who want to escape, to escape from their cities, their life, their social condition. Yeah. Is there something hedonistic in the idea of escaping. No, no, they're not escaping. You know, I tell you what they're doing. They're trying to find more interesting things to do. They're trying to find something better to do that night with more interesting people, they have more excitement, more fulfilling lives. Yes, your characters, they are full of desires. Yeah, that's so good, isn't it? And the sexual desire is very strong, too. Yeah, that's great. So, at what way does sexuality define our identity? Well, that's a very, very interesting question. It's an interesting question because you'd have to ask the person what their sexuality meant to them. I mean, there are many people for whom sexuality, they, they don't give a damn, they don't care. It's nothing. There are other people who really need to have a lot of sex with a lot of different people. Or they need to, to, to live like this, like that, or whatever. Um, I would, I think we don't live enough according to our pleasure. We don't take our pleasure seriously. We take our work seriously. But our pleasure, the pleasure of the body, the pleasure of being touched, the pleasure of the caress, the pleasure of, you know, as children we are caressed all the time, we are kissed all the time. I remember as a kid being kissed by my aunts, by my uncles, by my father, by my family. Uh, and it's very sensual. Um, and we have to take that seriously. We need that for the rest of our lives. And we need to do that to others. It's a very beautiful thing, very intimate, and it shows love. So this matters. And who we make love to, and how we make love, and how we touch other people. Our pleasure is at the center of our lives. People are very, very unhappy if they're with the wrong sexual partner. Do you think that people uh, are afraid of pleasures? Yeah, it's terrified. Something that, 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 yes. Terrified something. of pleasures because we, 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 we are brought up to work. We are brought up to be slaves. Nobody at, at school, you should have lessons on pleasure. The pleasures of food, the pleasures of walking, the pleasures of reading, the pleasures of listening to music, the pleasures of conversation, the pleasures of, of sexuality, of pleasures of caressing other people. That would be a good lesson, wouldn't it, in, on the school curri cur curriculum? because our pleasures are, are, are where our desire is. And usually then we are at our best, at our happiest, at our most fulfilled, most creative. You know, I write out of pleasure. I don't write because there's a slave whipping me. I'm a slave being whipped. I write because I like to write. And you read because you like to read. And that's a beautiful exchange. There's nothing, uh, uh, there's no money involved in that. It's just uh, two people doing something mutually pleasurable. Svi smo potekli iz žene i u ženu želimo da se vratimo. Obrazovanje nestaje pred ženskim telom. Neverovatno je što iko nalazi vremena da se bavi filozofijom, književnošću, psihologijom ili istorijom. A i žene su toga svesne. 
I zato na ulici uvek izgledaju kao da žure. Lepotica nikad ne hoda polako. I would like to quote uh, your hero from the last word, who is the famous writer, and mm -hmm. he says, all sex and pleasures include a poisonous drop of perversion mm -hmm. or devilish transgression of evil. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, Kanif Goreci? Oh, all sex is perversion. It should be perversion. Uh, but what means perversion? I would say uh, uh, any form of sexuality that is accompanied by fantasy. I mean, my dog isn't a pervert. My dog doesn't have... I don't think he even has sexual fantasies. Uh, but everybody else here in this room, or everybody here has sexual fantasies. Uh, and their sexual fantasies are really, really wild, you know, really crazy. And, and you can't have sex without having sexual fantasies. So in our mind, we're all perverts. All of us are perverts, because since we were children, we had sexual fantasies. And that's part of our life. And our sexual fantasies open the door to our real sexuality. Sexual uh, 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 fantasies are not, uh, in, in, instead of sexuality, they, 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 they are the, the route to, to satisfaction and, and to pleasure. But they can be very, very wild and very frightening for, for people too. So we are perverse creatures. But that's one of the most wonderful things about us. And what about decency? What do you mean by decency? Do you mean uh, what means to be decent? Yeah, you tell me. What, what, no, no, I, 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 would, like, I would like... I, I want you to okay, tell me. I'd, no, love, no, to I hear, like, I I'd like, love to hear it from you. I would like to quote one of your favorite philosopher, I think. Nietzsche. 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 Yes. Cristiano Ronaldo is my favorite philosopher at the moment. Uh, who? But who? Cristiano Ronaldo. Ronaldo. Why? Because he's one of my favorite footballers. But Nietzsche also I like. So he says that art originates from what he calls inner anarchy mm -hmm. and never from so-called decency. Yeah. So it seems to me that you believe that anarchy is a good literary tool. Well, you think, of, you... think, of, think of the, 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 the greatest artists that we have. Think of Shakespeare. I mean, he's a great artist, his work is controlled, but there's something quite anarchic, disturbing, weird. Think of uh, Hamlet, or think of a painting by Francis Bacon, or think of a play by Beckett. I mean, these are what this, or a, a novel by William Burroughs. This is weird stuff, you know. Yes. Great art is weird, and when I say weird, it's not decent. Decency is nothing. It's strange. It's violent. It's sexually perverse. It's aggressive. It's homoerotic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all great art is of that form, you know. So the human imagination is wild, and Nietzsche is referring to that, you know. And why and how do you write? Um, you say that uh, you write in this book, that you write in order to reinvent yourself. Yeah, I, I, I write because I, I have an impulse and that makes me go to my desk. And if I don't have an impulse, I don't go to the desk. I go out for a walk or I do something else. I have a strong impulse that I want to say this thing. You have a desire. I, I, yeah, I have a strong yeah. desire to say this thing, and I, I also feel that nobody has said this, even though I'm sure they have. I think, I've got to write this down. I really feel this strongly. I've got to say this. Like writing about race in, in, the, in the 70s, or the 80s, and so on. People should know this, you know. It's like a cause. Uh, and I think you'll find that with any artist. You know, they really want to do it. So when I write, it occurs to me. I don't uh, uh, try and make it happen. But I want to write about serious things. But I also like to write about things in an amusing way. Okay. And this is from Ivana, uh, my film director.